Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this lunchtime webinar brought to you by the UCL Centre for Ethics and Law. My name is Iris Chu, and I'm director of the Centre. Today, I'll introduce to you the proceedings and the speakers before we start. Our event today celebrates the book launch by Dr. Antonio Maracci of his new book, Transnational Securities Regulation, the Role of IOSCO and Major Capital Markets Jurisdictions in International Rulemaking. Dr. Maracci is currently Vice President at the Compliance Function of a European Globally Systemically Important Bank. He's also a lecturer at the Universities of Passau and Leipzig in Germany. Dr. Maracci obtained his PhD in Law at the European University Institute at Florence. Dr. Maracci will provide his reflections and key messages in the book for about 20 minutes. And this will be followed by discussions provided by two eminent commentators. First, Professor Regis Bismuth, Professor of Law at Sciences Po, will give his reflections on the book. This will be for about 10 to 15 minutes and followed by Professor Pierre Henri Connect who is Max Planck Fellow at the Max Planck Institute Luxembourg for International European Regulatory and Procedural Law. And Professor Connect will also speak for about 10 to 15 minutes. We will then give Dr. Maracci the opportunity to respond to these reflections for about five to 10 minutes. During any time of the proceedings, if any member of the audience has a question or wishes to raise a comment or opinion, please feel free to send it through to the Q&A function of the webinar. I will be moderating the Q&A session towards the end of the webinar, and hopefully we'll be able to address uh, your comments, feedback, and concerns. I will also like to mention that those who have registered to attend this webinar will receive a freebie at the end of this, and that will come through through your email uh, shortly. So without further ado, let me now give the floor to Dr. Marachi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for um, organizing the uh, webinar today and for this great chance. I'm really honored uh, to be here and in particular um, thanks to uh, Professor Chu, of course, and for her time and to the two eminent discussions uh, uh, discussing today, um, Professor Bismuth and uh, Professor Konak. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Um, it's I'm very happy and honored uh, to be here today and to present my book. Um, I will now um, share um, some slides. Um, I hope you can see it. Can you? Yes, very good. Uh, now, uh, okay. Um, so uh, this book, uh, uh, this new book of mine is actually the uh, result of, uh, uh, I can say many weekends spent at home during the COVID lockdowns and which, you know, I wanted to turn and kind of uh, uh, boring afternoons into something more, uh, let me say, intellectually stimulating. So I decided to, uh, you know, resume some of the um, uh, a very important um, uh, strand of uh, uh, research that I started back uh, when I was a PhD student at the EUI in Florence more than 10 years ago. Um, and I decided to uh, write a book on something that I was feeling was, you know, partially missing in legal and to some extent also political science research. Uh, I had two main research uh, research questions on mine. Um, the first one was um, an analysis of um, the uh, global standard setter for securities markets, IOSCO. Um, and the second question that I had in mind was who was able, which jurisdictions have been over the years able to influence IOSCO regulatory, regulatory production? Um, because the first question basically was following the need to uh, that, that I had, that I perceived some kind of a, of a gap in research concerning 
a one single book, one single monograph taking care of uh, delving into IOSCO, its regulatory production, its history. And that one uh, uh, was actually uh, was actually missing. And then the second point is I wanted to, let me say, challenge the doxa that actually, you know, uh, many people believe, many people think that, you know, the U.S. has been uh, the uh, and is still the driving regulatory power around the world for global securities uh, standards. And I wanted to see whether it is uh, it's been the case and whether it is still uh, the case. So the book is split, is divided into parts. The first one is basically, I would say, could be also one uh, uh, self-standing uh, um, uh, monograph on IOSCO itself. So here I analyze the IOSCO legal nature, uh, which I label as unorthodox uh, because it's uh, it is an international organization, like its name says, but it's actually incorporated as a non-profit private law entity in Spain. So it has a private law, private law nature, but its members are public administrative authorities coming from basically almost all jurisdictions around the world. So it's a kind of a mix that has like this double phase. And formally speaking, it is multilateral because the decisions are made at the president's committee that meets once a year, but actually the uh, most important decisions are made uh, the driving decisions are made at the board level and the board basically brings together the most important uh, the most developed uh, securities markets then i analyze the uh, relationships and interactions that a yosco um, has with uh, um, other international organizations and uh, in this uh, uh, in this analysis, I, I, I try to uh, highlight the different kind of relationships, more political, more technical, uh, um, extremely uh, uh, interesting, for instance, uh, is the relationship that IOSCO has with the International Standard Organization, which is purely technical, but has been absolutely important, for instance, for development on some specific uh, standards on derivatives. Then, of course, the rulemaking itself, uh, which is like several other uh, international organizations, is based on consensus. And here, uh, the role of the chair is basically the most important one. And I've also used uh, the data that are available that is available at the IOSCO website and asking for more data directly to IOSCO personnel. Um, uh, on which authorities, which members were have been over the years chairing IOSCO uh, standard uh, and making committees and to, uh, to see, to detect which ones were actually more involved and more able to influence the regulatory outcome. Then like two important points, the standard implementation monitoring and the uh, cross-border enforcement cooperation. Um, I put it like together, though they are into different chapters, because they both work in a sort of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, monitoring mechanism. By, there, um, by that, I mean that uh, IOSCO has developed a kind of um, self-monitoring system where uh, its members, though its standards are soft, software standards, its members are pushed to uh, cooperate together, basically for fear of um, a sort of uh, a reputational risk, and also because cooperation, in particular for enforcement, is essential in 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 today in today's global markets. Cooperation between authorities, but this mechanism that actually still private law soft has teeth uh, because if um, a member doesn't is not willing to cooperate with its peers, it may lose. Um, its uh, uh, status uh, within IOSCO, and this definitely affects um, its reputation also at home. The second part of the book instead um, uh, very much looks at the uh, influence played by the US since the very beginning, and then the emerging influence of the European Union. I also wanted to highlight where I could find you know, uh, sufficient data, the role played by so-called middle powers uh, or, you know, uh, um, we can define middle powers in terms of uh, um, regulatory influence within IOSCO. Um, 
extremely important has been, for instance, the role of the UK, France, but also smaller jurisdictions that I was a bit surprised to find so active within IOSCO. Australia, New Zealand, Portugal, they, had, they, they were very much, uh, uh, very much active over the years. Getting back to the United States, uh, the US, the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission has been um, since the uh, beginning of IOSCO has been the driving authority. Uh, IOSCO uh, was funded in, 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 in North America, uh, was uh, created as a Pan-American forum of securities regulators coming from North and South America, and then it turned um, in, in 83, it turned global. But the US and the SEC in particular was the driving force. The European Union started emerging basically after the crisis. I would say that uh, with the conclusion, with the entry into force of the Lisbon Treaty and the establishment of ESMA, uh, there is a big question now about ESMA and what ESMA, will, what the European Securities and Market Authority will do in the future, whether it will join the Enforcement Cooperation Agreement of IOSCO, the Memorandum of, of Understanding, which is a key uh, achievement of IOSCO, we will see. That's my guess is yes, they will. Uh, but that's um, something that we will see in the coming months or years. Um, the, uh, in the second part of the book, I split analyze single standards, single case studies, and I cluster these standards according to their nature. So uh, the first one is, you know, um, uh, the first cluster um, uh, gathers um, horizontal standards, meaning standards that actually cross um, uh, different topics and look at the substance of a regulatory framework uh, as such. Uh, the second set of standard looks at the um, um, uh, at the standards uh, addressed to uh, public authorities, so at the best practices developed by IOSCO members themselves. The third set of standards that I think uh, is the most intriguing, uh, intriguing and uh, uh, fascinating one is the one addressed, is those standards addressed directly to global uh, private players. And the fourth one is connected to my analysis of uh, Yosko's interactions with other international organizations. And is that set, set, of, uh, set of standards that uh, Yosko adopts and develops in cooperation and in concert with other uh, international organizations. Well, uh, through, all, through those standards, we can see that Basically, until the big crisis of uh, 2008, uh, the US, the SEC, has been always there, always extremely important in uh, transposing, in promoting its domestic standards, and has been definitely the leading jurisdiction. That doesn't mean that other jurisdictions haven't cooperated, haven't uh, influenced IOSCO regulatory standards. As I said, there are like several cases, very important cases where uh, the UK in particular has been pretty active. But the US, uh, the US is always there, and uh, it's it's something that uh, it's it's very very evident. But things basically started changing uh, in 2008. Um, that's that's when with the crisis when when basically the U.S. Uh, uh, starts losing some of its uh, charm, and uh, here uh, it's a combination of uh, the emergence of the European Union, and there are two cases in particular that are like extremely evident: investment protection and the credit rating agencies. We can also see uh, a strong influence of the of of the European Union law in the financial benchmark case. Uh, but again, we need to be extremely careful here. Uh, uh, that doesn't mean that the US disappears and you know, uh, or doesn't have any power to influence uh, 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 transnational standards for securities markets. And actually, the fourth set of, of uh, case study of standards, the fourth case study, the one on derivatives, is, uh, you know, gives evidence that actually the US is still there. Uh, still plays uh, 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 the USC plays a leadership role, and and 
the derivatives field, uh, it's basically the derivative standards have been uh, influenced strongly by uh, the US, the US approach. And here again, we see a strong involvement of the UK and for the first time, the EU as such mentioning, for instance, the European interest uh, and the European Central Bank as, ma as member of IOSCO, the European Commission fully involved in the negotiations and discussions about the um, uh, derivative standards. Um, there are like two main conclusions that I, I achieve with, uh, with my book. The first one is, um, 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 is about IOSCO regulatory production itself. Um, I, I think that the more IOSCO adopts standards that are directly um, um, addressed to private authority, to private parties, the more basically it can uh, contribute to, uh, I would say, to building um, what I define as a sectorial transnational privatized regulatory law. And by regulatory, I mean the public elan, the public spirit, uh, which is uh, given basically by the fact that IOSCO full members are regulatory public agencies, but the privatized denotes the instrumental use of private law instead of traditional public law. So it's uh, this kind of uh, uh, this kind of melange between uh, public spirit and the instrumental use of private law. And then the uh, the second the second um, uh, conclusion that I have achieved is a, is about the uh, uh, future of of IOSCO. Uh, IOSCO has been the playground where you know uh, regulatory powers have been trying to uh, wield their uh, regulatory influence, but it's been more US driven until like 15 years ago. Now we have seen in the last 10 years, the emergence of the European Union, strong influence of the European Union, but that was before Brexit. And we know that the city of London, the practices developed by the uh, British regulator, they have been extremely important also in the development of uh, European Union law for financial markets. So we need to see uh, what role the, EU, the EU will be able to play um uh, in the future in IOSCO and um the uh, uh, uh and also the role of the, of of the UK of the UK itself um i think that for this short overview uh i think it's uh, uh it's enough uh, one short clarification when i started by saying that um um you know um uh, there were like some interesting uh, publications, uh, you know, uh, about IOSCO. Um, I am I'm very much honored that uh, both uh, uh, Professor Konak and Professor Bismuth are here because uh, they have published, uh, uh, you know, extremely important, extremely important, uh, uh, you know, they have extremely important publication production about IOSCO and the standards. And uh, so uh, this has been uh, guiding, guiding for me. I'll bring us into the panel uh, for discussion. So um, I hope the members of the audience are now teased uh, by uh, Antonio's book. I think he's, he's given um, many high level messages that are very intriguing, but uh, you wouldn't find out the details uh, unless uh, you buy the book. And uh, hopefully, uh, I, I'm sure this is now available and hopefully uh, you all support uh, Antonio uh, in relation to his new book. Um, I would like to now give the floor to Professor Regis Bismuth uh, to provide his reflections uh, on the book. Uh, Regis, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chu. Uh, can you hear me well? That's fine. Yeah. OK, perfect. Uh, thank you. Thank you, of course, for, for the invitation and for, for giving me this opportunity to comment on Antonio's book. Um, um, this book is a very refreshing read for me, uh, to the extent that I um, I published my PhD on um, the cooperation of international financial regulators uh, more than 12 years ago. Uh, so um, I, I couldn't say that I left the shores of international financial regulation for the last uh, for the last 12 years, but I worked on other topics uh, to some extent. 
And uh, many things have changed over the last, uh, the last uh, 12 years. And reading this book with Antonio's fresh look on international financial regulation has been uh, extremely, uh, extremely in interesting. Uh, so it's a book about international financial regulation. It is, of course, mostly a book about Yosco as, as an organization. Uh, Yosco is clearly the keystone, uh, the center of gravity of this, uh, of this research. And it is clearly, in my view, now the reference work on this, uh, on this institution, because there have been many, many publications on international financial architecture, publications on the Basel Committee on Banking Supervisions, on the Financial Stability Board, but on Yosco itself, uh, to my knowledge, this is the only fully fledged uh, research focusing exclusively and really exhaustively on, um, on Yosco. Um, and it is a very clear depiction and analysis of how Yosco works and also what are the constraints waiting on the organization for its uh, standard setting um, activity. Um, and what is interesting in that, in that regard is that it focuses both on the institutional and also on the substantive aspects of, um, of, uh, of Yosco. And what I've discovered as well, uh, because I haven't studied Yosco that much over the last 10 years, is basically that Yosco has developed uh, what, what Antonio actually labels in his book as the supervisory spirit uh, of, uh, of Yosco. The fact that Yosco has not turned itself into a kind of financial regulator or financial supervisory or financial supervisor, but it has developed some supervisory tools uh, to some extent that are still extremely soft, but this is, this is something uh, new, uh, new to me, and that is also very, uh, very interesting. So, um, I'm I'm not a, a securities law practitioner. I'm not a securities lawyer. Um, I'm my, my specialization is more public international law, administrative law, public law in in general. So, I think that my comments will probably focus more on these different dimensions of uh, Antonio's book. Um, I think it's very interesting to see that uh, Antonio's book speaks to both private and public law um, and public lawyers uh, to, uh, to some extent, both international and domestic ones uh, as, uh, uh, as well. Um, I would like to praise uh, this book for giving me more, uh, particularly some very interesting insights on how your school deals with um, the issue of jurisdictional conflicts uh, between its members. Uh, we have a multilateral MOU in Yosco. Uh, we have issues relating to cross-border enforcement. Um, there are some very interesting jurisdictional issues with what Antonio actually labels at horizontal and vertical uh, standards. In Antonio's work, Antonio's, you do not over theorize uh, this, I would say, jurisdictional conflict dimension. But uh, I would like to say that, um, you know, um, um, researchers uh, or other lawyers particularly interested in issues of jurisdiction, extraterritoriality, how states actually exercise their jurisdiction in an interconnected um, uh, financial market world actually would find extremely valuable what this book has uh, has to offer in uh, in, uh, in that regard. So this is why I find also this book extremely uh, extremely interesting, extremely uh, valuable. Um, eventually, I would like just to raise three or four points that I would like uh, that I find eventually interesting also to um, to discuss. Um, this is a book about uh, financial regulation, but not so much about financial service liberalization. There are a lot of developments in this book on the relation between Yosco and other international institutions or fora, such as the IMF, the World Bank, the G20, the Financial Stability Board, the Basel Committee, and so on and so forth. Um, you mentioned sometimes the, um, the WTO, but mostly in contrast to Yosco, uh, you mentioned the WTO as a classic intergovernmental and treaty-based uh, international organization that Yosco is, is not. Um, and um, in this book, 
uh, you do not really develop um, what could be the connection between um, Yosco and the WTO uh, in substance um, between Yosco and uh, the financial services liberalization agenda. Um, because why do we regulate? Uh, why do um, why does Yosco actually attempt to regulate? Um, uh, securities market. Um, actually, there is a very strong connection between uh, the imperatives of regulation and the uh, imperatives of liberalization, because liberalization of financial services requires creating a level playing field, ensuring financial stability, avoiding jurisdictional conflicts, and so on and so forth. So this is why it, I think, um, and I would like to have your, your view on that, um, uh, to what extent could Yosco be interesting for the WTO? The work of Yosco is sometimes mentioned in uh, the work of the WTO for trade policy review mechanism uh, within the framework of the, of the Committee of Trade in Financial Services, for instance. Um, and there is also an interesting discussion in, um, in the work of the WTO about what is an international standard? What is a genuine international standard in the context of the WTO? Because there is somehow, uh, and not really somehow, there is a presumption in WTO law that um, every domestic regulation that is based on what we call in WTO law an international standard cannot violate WTO law, cannot create unnecessary barriers to trade. And it is very interesting to see in the context of WTO law that an international standard is um, defined as a standard adopted by a multilateral institution open to all WTO members. And um, it is interesting to see that in the international financial architecture, actually, um, Yosco is one of the very few, perhaps with the uh, International Association of Insurance Supervisors, is, the, the, is one of, is, is probably, one of the most multilateral institutions, because if you compare the membership of Yosco with the membership of the Basel Committee, it is clear that Yosco is a multilateral institution that is not the case for other, uh, other institutions. So um, interestingly, from a WTO perspective, Yosco will be regarded as uh, an international standard setter legitimate in the eyes of WTO law. Uh, this leads me to another uh, issue um, what I would call the global south issue. Uh, so a great share of the book actually concerns uh, the um, declining influence of the US and the rising influence of the EU and somehow the EU US influence and hegemony in, uh, in UNESCO. Uh, and um, interestingly, during your presentation, you mentioned that there were some middle players so Australia, France, UK, New Zealand, and so on and so forth. But we are still talking about the global north here. And um, I would love to have your, uh, your views actually about, um, uh, about the global south in, uh, in your school, about uh, you know, specific stories concerning the participation of, let's say, Brazil, China, India within the UNESCO. We, we know that, and this is clear in your book, that they do participate in in some committees, that there are certain subcommittees concerning developing countries and so on and so forth. But we have the impression that they are mainly uh, spectators uh, at, uh, at USCO, that they are mainly in the shadow of uh, the EU-US interplay. So another very general and broad question, what about the global south uh, here? And do you see possibly things changing in the future in, uh, in that regard. Uh, there is a, a third and final, uh, very brief uh, topic I would like to, um, to mention, and it is also a more, more a question than, uh, than a remark. Uh, actually, I was particularly interested when I studied international financial regulation, um, I was interested in um, how sometimes the international financial uh, standard setting activities were used for domestic purposes. And I was wondering whether you noticed a strategy 
of domestic financial regulators or of regional financial regulators in the context of the uh, of the uh, of the EU actually using your score to advance uh, a given political agenda uh, by using your score argument for instance in the domestic context so we have negotiated this international standard within your score and we have to implement this domestically you do not have a word to say so Sometimes, you know, I, I, I think this existed for the Basel Committee, the fact that they use the international standard setting process to circumvent um, domestic regulatory constraints. And I wanted to know also if uh, this, uh, let's say, domestic international interplay existed uh, also within, um, uh, within your school. So I, I raised a lot of points, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Professor Konak will raise many other points that will be complementary to mine. Uh, and of course, just uh, just feel free to comment on those you might feel that are relevant to the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, in any case, Antonio, for for giving me uh, this opportunity to read the, your very interesting work. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Regis, for your reflections. Uh, I'm sure Antonio will be taking away a lot of this, and I'll be giving you an opportunity to respond uh, after I call on uh, Professor Konek uh, to, to comment. Um, so right now, I'd like to give the floor to uh, Professor Pionri Konek. Uh, Pionri, please. Um, Pionri, I think you might be on mute. Thank you. <laughs> So, so thank you very much, Iris. Thank you very much you, to you and Antonio for having me for this uh, very uh, wonderful event. And also uh, very insightful questions by Regis Bismuth. Uh, the one of Global Source is something also I had in mind, but then uh, I will leave the privilege to him. So uh, the book is, I mean, I was very impressed, but I'm very impressed by the book. I, I, I call this, I mean, Antonio is Italian, you know, and in Italy they make coffee with different blends, you know. And to me, I don't know where it comes from, but you know, it's a, to me, it's a masterful blend of practice, theory, and uh, with interviews, with uh, private, public, a po political science view, a legal uh, aspect, and some uh, prospect of finance. So it's a very impressive book, uh, which you achieve. So I mean, congratulations. If this is what you do during weekends, I mean, what do you do during the, the rest of the week, you know? <laughs> So I mean, I, I'm very impressed. Uh, it was really nice to uh, to um, read it. You you look at all the, the topics. Uh, I mean, as has been mentioned already, IOSCO is not well is not well known actually. It's it's a club. It's actually okay, a large one, but still a club, and uh, they don't advertise themselves that much. They are kind of a bit shy in a sense. Uh, so you made the effort, you know, to to go to them and also uh, get the information. And it's well known, it's not well known enough. And in sense also, because of this, your book is quite, very timely because IOSCO is moving. Uh, we can see this, you know, uh, since uh, post COVID with the ESG agenda, uh, environment, social governance and climate change uh, issues. So, I mean, uh, they appear more and more. We got invited to uh, G20, more G20 events uh, and so on. So they are really integrated. And they start to show up a bit like OECD would show up also in this kind of event and so on. So your book is quite timely because, uh, of course, the, the, the wonderful book by Regis Bismuth is a bit, I mean, is of course, the authoritative book, but I mean, it has 12, 12 uh, years. So now you have updated. So it's really nice that we have something which covers everything. I even learned things. I mean, of course, uh, I'm not, I cannot know everything. But you know, I learned a lot, of, a lot of things. I mean, a lot of things, a few things which were really interesting, such as, but I was not surprised when I saw about it, the influence of France in the process. But France was already, you know, uh, pushing for IOSCO, even when it was uh, still the International Associ uh, Inter American Association of Securities Commission. So this, I should have guessed in a sense, but you, you, you put it in the book. That's, I mean, uh, very nice to know. And also something which you know, put in the book, but I want to point, is that uh, Caesar, you know, and sorry, FESCO, the Forum of Urban Security Co uh, Commission was also a French. It came from a French. So it's funny because the US did bits of the world and France, and France was associated, although it did not appear until 1986, if I remember correctly, or 83, and then uh, 83. 
And then uh, France did the same with EDVU with Fresco. And Fresco then became Caesar, and Caesar then became ESMA. So it's, it's nice. I mean, it's uh, not so surprising, but France was also quite involved, uh, not as the highest level like the US, of course, but still, you know, it's a, a kind of big player when you think uh, about it. And also, you mentioned several times that Prada was uh, quite influential, I mean, quite active, and so on. I mean, France has been, uh, has been around in this. Okay, when I look at also the, uh, the footnotes or the uh, people you quote, I mean, this is, I mean, you, you, you have nailed all the right people, I would say. I, mean, I will exclude myself, but I see, you know, you have Jack Coffey, uh, Neil Moloney, Kelly Jordan, Howard Jackson, Regis Bismus, um, uh, there's also Brummer. I mean, a few others I might forget. I forgot, I apologize to them already, but I mean, uh, you, have nailed the, the few people who have worked on it. Because in a sense, people, Iosco is a club, but those who work on Iosco is also a club <laughs> because it's so it's quite restrictive and it's not so easy to get access to information. Yeah? You have to engage with them. Uh, they are not, I mean, they have a website, but doesn't say is, there's much more than uh, you can uh, meet the eye, so to say. So you did this effort and I can say, you know, welcome to this club, you know. Uh, you are, you enter uh, to this club, you know, uh, and by the way, I even use also for my report for the EU Parliament, your work you did at the European uh, University Institute, you know, a few years ago. So it was very useful and I found, found it already very insightful. So now you know, you're part of a club. This is, uh, so welcome. This is one first achievement, I would say, from the book. You're really now part of this uh, nice club of people and I hope you will, uh, uh, we, we of course, we all keep in touch. Okay, uh, one point on, um, uh, what the, the points on ESMA and these developments, and then I will come to also three questions. I mean, three general uh, questions for you. Okay, you're saying that uh, the US, it's moving from a duopoly to, a, uh, sorry, to, from a monopoly to some form of duopoly maybe, and monopoly, or, sorry, or mi monopoly. I think you have the right point. Of course, uh, you have to, um, Keep in mind what uh, Regis Bismus called rightfully the global source, which is uh, disorganized. That's the point. Uh, you know, Brazil doesn't have the same interest as India and so on. So, I mean, yeah, in general, it's a box, but uh, I think everybody fights for himself. Uh, whereas, you know, uh, when you look at, uh, I mean, China, Japan, it's not the same uh, interest and so on. But of course, uh, when you get view, well, it more or less goes in the same direction. And the UK is not so far behind because it's despite Brexit, they have essentially the same rules. Not to forget that EU law, series law, is basically a lot uh, US and UK uh, law in France. So, in, so there's a club here and it's overrepresented, which is not that bad. But of course, this might change. Okay, when... Um, Looking back at ESMA and, and this push by the EU, I think you you nailed it. There's an attempt uh, for the EU to be to push on this, and uh, of course Jean-Paul Servet, who is now the, 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 president, the chairman of IOSCO, I mean, is a key player here. And I would just like to point the atten your attention to one point. Uh, Jean-Paul Servet is uh, is the chair of the Belgian Authority. And uh, you say that rightly so, that uh, this, the regulator, in a sense, this is a mix of ESMA, which has supervisory power, but also the commission, because the commission is making the rules you know, at the end of the day. In this kind of fora, uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, the commission, uh, strangely enough, I mean, because they, I mean, they basically made some mistakes, they end up below ESMA, which is kind of funny. And when you look at ESMA, ESMA is not the commission. Okay, it's, I completely agree that ESMA will be uh, will strengthen, will have more influence, but you have two players here, a bit like, you know, in, in uh, with US, with SEC, CFTC, Canada, where you have uh, two or three players, I think it's two, in uh, Quebec and Ontario. And uh, you have uh, this view that you have two players from, from the EU, uh, which don't necessarily share the same agenda. So keep this in mind. Uh, Jean-Paul Servet, as chair of IOSCO, of course, would promote more or less the EU agenda, but not necessarily, because he has to promote the ESMA view, and the ESMA view is not necessarily the view of a commission, and they might be different. Of course, we have to co coordinate and correct, but keep this in mind, because I've seen examples you know, of basically fights, 
between uh, survey and the commission on uh, different topics. The commission has its own ideas of, about some stuff and uh, they might not uh, like it. Let's, let's take one example, you know, for instance, uh, cross-border equivalence. The commission is very reluctant. Well, ESMA might be, uh, you know, more, uh, more flexible, but of course, currently it's hard to, to change this. So just for you to keep in mind from my this is personal experience, but uh, be careful, uh, survey will not be the voice and is not the voice of EU. Of course, it would more or less push in this direction, but there's a difference. Uh, it can play a role. Okay, now I have uh, two, uh, I mean, three uh, general kind of to topics to share with you and uh, which um, come uh, around two issues. Two jurisdictional uh, uh, questions and uh, one really topical. Okay, you, you mentioned in my paper, uh, thank you, by the way, thank you very much. It's always very hum humbling to, that people find your, your work useful, you know, that it's read to start with, <laughs> someone read it. And uh, you mentioned the role of the ERC, European uh, Regulatory Committee, as a driving force, and which uh, you know, I propose might develop in 2018. And this is what has happened more or less with survey taking the lead. And uh, we see that uh, the EU is much more active within IOSCO on one topic, which is essentially an EU topic, which is ESG. So environment, social governance. The EU is developing its own you know, standards, the ESRS, European uh, Sustainability Reporting Standards. And uh, the international sphere, the global sphere, is trying also to develop its Answers the ISSB standards, International Sustainability uh, uh, Standard Board is uh, publishing the, uh, now I forgot the name of standards, but whatever. Uh, so you have two sets of standards who are starting to appear, and the EU is trying to push these standards on the global stage, which, of course, if it succeeds, will be a huge achievement. And we do this uh, not so much directly, but through IOSCO. And in a sense, survey and uh, ISCO is pushing this direction a lot, of course, supported in principle by all the uh, EU member states who are represented in ISCO and those EU jurisdiction represented within uh, the, uh, the board. Now, um, I, have to, I have to say, and this is a question for you, that I have doubt it will succeed. I have doubt that the EU will succeed in basically uh, exporting through IOSCO its view of what ESG is about, uh, its view of these standards. We have the issue of double materiality, uh, but there are other stuff. So I think we're uh, witnessing exactly what you describe in the book, a, a shift, that's correct, a shift where the EU is asserting itself uh, and doing it with what is at really at the heart of this commission with all these ESG standards. But I have adopt it will work because the level of standard that the EU wants is, I mean, out of touch with, I mean, not, not just the UK, but it's going to be out of touch with the global source, basically, and even the US. By the way. So, I mean, I mean, well, maybe it works, you know, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm still, I'm open-minded, but I'm leaning on the side that it might not work this way that much, but at least it fits your point that the EU is trying to sense rebalance because who could have imagined, you know, 10 years ago that the EU will come to IOSCO and basically say to IOSCO, well, <laughs> push this at the international level. So it's, it's, a, it's a complete it's a sea change, but I'm not sure it will succeed uh, for obvious reason. Probably one, I mean, the most important one for me is it's the level of disclosure is so high, so granular, so costly, I mean, uh, not everybody wants this. The ESG is essentially EU stuff at the end of the day. Climate change is different. Climate change is a global consensus to fight this, but ESG is much wider, much different. Okay, that's the first point. And uh, also the uh, issue of extraterritoriality. I mean, we used to complain. I mean, IOSCO was useful in a sense also because you could complain to the US, to the SEC about extraterritoriality. Uh, okay, they would say we're not responsible, that's Congress, but uh, it was a channel. And now, what do we see within the You have the uh, CSRD, you know, Corporate CSRD Reporting Directive, which was adopted 14th of December, uh, published, uh, yeah, adopted and then published uh, in December, uh, which is extraterritorial. I mean, 
So VU is playing exactly like VUS. So it's going to apply to VUK, whether they like it or not, basically. And so on. So this is going to create a mess, to be honest, because everybody can say, well, I want to apply. And then this might create the need for cross-border equivalence. Uh, we'll see. Again, uh, I'm not so sure that the VUS will really comply, huh? uh, not speaking even about China. Uh, I mean, I mean, in sense, you, you, get, you get the answer. So uh, my uh, first question is a comment question is about, yes, uh, there's a push, this is clear. I mean, a very ambitious push, which is both, you know, more ESG and more extraterritorial. Will it work? Well, maybe it's too much for the EU to shoot. We'll see with uh, all these other countries which might, might push back, we'll see. My second point is about the UK. What role do you see for the UK in this post-Brexit environment? I thought the UK would be, well, I've been disappointed because essentially I, I had the hope, uh, well, very quickly I realized it would not happen, but the EU will be open-minded with the UK, you know, and, and play, you know, a, a good face partner. It was not the way. Equivalence was used politically, which of course then destroys the tool. Because if you don't apply it to the, with the UK, you don't, cannot apply it to the, to the others. So uh, I'm a bit, uh, it, it's, it's a bad situation that the EU has rejected, but maybe we we'll come back, you know. Uh, maybe we we'll come back at, at some point. And um, so, I mean, the UK in this situation is, uh, why, why, do, why do you see the UK in this new environment where basically there's no equivalence? Uh, I thought they would be more active, you know, in Madrid. I thought they would send a plane of 30 people to double the size of IOSCO in one day <laughs> and start to influence. Uh, this has not happened uh, so far, but you never know. So I don't know if you have any view on this. And my last point is uh, you discussed very correctly about the fact that IOSCO has been quite more active, you know, in uh, new fields, benchmark, regulation, this kind of stuff. Uh, they are much, much more visible. I mean, also quite often on request by the FSB. Sorry, I'm done. So uh, quite often on request on the FSB. But uh, there's one area where I would like to get your views where I'm surprised we have not moved that much. Uh, although it would be a nice area for, I mean, uh, at least general principles, or principles. This is crypto regulation, crypto assets. I mean, we have a regulation in the EU. Uh, uh, which has been uh, just uh, adopted. And uh, the US now is going to have one after the disaster from some Sam Bachmann Fried, FTX. And I'm a bit surprised that IOSCO, uh, maybe, or maybe I missed it, uh, has not embraced this because as I would think, I mean, if you have to read crypto, maybe it should be international because uh, crypto is popping up all over the place. I mean, the Bitcoin by definition has no border. So this would be a nice place for IOSCO to show its usefulness, but uh, I don't, I've not seen a, a lot of this, maybe because the US didn't want to read anything, uh, probably. I don't know. I mean, uh, so these are my, you know, two, uh, three points. What do you think about the chances of success of the EU to really uh, assert itself, you know, uh, and also bring the global source with them or not? Second, what do you see the place of the UK here? It has not developed, you know, as I would have liked personally. And um, what about, you know, crypto assets? Uh, why IOSCO is not moving? And on this, I thank you very much for the invitation. And congratulations for, it's, it's a wonderful book. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Pierre-Henri, for your reflections and for your questions to Antonio. Um, we, we are running rather tight on time and, and there will be uh, several questions, I think, for Antonio from the audience as well. So could I just request that, Antonio, you quickly respond in roughly five minutes or under? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. Uh, 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 very, very shortly. Um, I think it's it's the point of you know uh, the need of 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 uh, uh, transnational regulation when it comes to uh, liberalization of financial services. It's a very good point, um, and it's very interesting. Uh, I would, and it it actually you know it leads us to the point of uh, uh, cross border uh, uh, cooperation 
but cross-border cooperation is just in terms of enforcement, but cross-border cooperation in terms of supervisory and regulatory cooperation between authorities and sometimes also between legislatures. Uh, that's actually <laughs> something that I would like to start in, in the second half of, uh, of, uh, of this year. So um, I'm glad that actually, you know, uh, uh, we have um, reached some, you know, somehow the uh, the same conclusion. It's, that's that's uh, something that um, I'm planning in my mind uh, as soon as I have some time. So uh, hopefully without any lockdowns. <laughs> and um, uh, I think that the uh, point of the strategy of domestic regulators basically using IOSCO uh, also for uh, domestic reasons. Uh, yes, I think the most, uh, the first example could be the SEC itself that was using, was thinking of using IOSCO as a forum to export its own uh, uh, legislation and approach or some kind of uh, you know of pushing other uh, uh, countries to adopt legislation on insider trading back in the 80s that was probably the very first example and of the um um bilateral uh, um, uh, memorandum of understanding that the SEC at that time was concluding with uh, with other uh, uh, authorities uh, they were all aimed in, in the 80s to fight insider trading. The most important one, the first one was with the Swiss authorities uh, because it's uh, uh, at that time, uh, uh, American investors were using um, some uh, uh, offshore accounts they had in Europe, they had in, 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 uh, in Switzerland uh, to basically to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, do insider trading uh, abroad. So um, that's, and then, you know, of this practice for 20 years, they, they, they led to the, after the September 11th uh, events, uh, led to the establishment of the multilateral memorandum of understanding. So I think, for instance, this is this was the first uh, very good example of how IOSCO was being used as a platform, uh, as a forum uh, for uh, domestic strategies. The global south, um, I think it's extremely important uh, and it's not lip service, it is. Um, and IOSCO has been working a lot. And I try to give emphasis on the global south, especially when I speak of the emerging um, uh, securities markets in the chapter on um, 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 standard implementation monitoring, because the uh, tools that IOSCO uh, uh, has crafted in terms of uh, uh, monitoring the actual implementation of its standards, um, it's not just you know uh, uh, ranking uh, the different uh, the different implementation level of its members, but also supporting them. And and here as well, the U.S. has emerged over the time as the provider of of training of uh, kind of grooming for. Uh, authorities coming from emerging markets, and it's it's here. Ayosco has been very active. Ayosco has become more inclusive in terms of uh, 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 including uh, um, the South or the emerging markets in its uh, uh, board, uh, in its key decision making decision making body. Um, when basically uh, India, Brazil, and the People's Republic of China were admitted to. Uh, to uh, IOSCO board. Um, I, I think that there are a couple of cases where, for instance, IOSCO has been also used. There is one important case, for instance, that I mentioned about India, um, where IOSCO has been used to promote um, um, a cooperation and India uh, leveraged, uh, the Indian regulator leveraged on IOSCO piece. Um, uh, the point is that um, for instance, China uh, could be, uh, China, I mean, like mainland China, uh, PR, the PRC, could be uh, an important player. Um, it very much depends on its own, um, uh, you know, uh, how open, uh, apart from Hong Kong, uh, for instance, the hubs of uh, Shanghai and Zhejiang. Uh, are about how open they, they they will become in in the coming years. So I think the role of China is that we still need to understand what 
what direction China will be taking in the next, in this decade. Um, um, so in, in, in my, in my uh, um, uh, uh, private industry experience, I, I happen to, uh, to work and live uh, in Shanghai and I see a lot of potentials, but uh, is, I still don't know uh, uh, the direction that the PRC will be, will be taking. Hong Kong, uh, though Hong Kong you know, is a special region, uh, has been uh, extremely active, but we cannot, of course, consider Hong Kong as an emerging, as an emerging financial market. Um, um, getting back to uh, the points of uh, Professor Konak, um, uh, the role of the UK um, I think that the role of the UK so far has been extremely important for the development of EU financial law. Um, I, uh, I think personally that um, Brexit has been and is a lose-lose game. Um, probably, uh, as you hinted, um, even a little more for the UK uh, because the EU and the EU law could be working or was working as, as an amplifier of some practices developed in London. And now with the UK outside the EU, without being able to influence the EU normative production, uh, uh, basically has to be uh, physically more, <laughs> its footprint within a Yosco, uh, it, it must be much bigger to exert the same influence. Um, so either they choose basically to send from London to Madrid, I don't know, like 20 people, as you suggested, or I would also see uh, like, you know, a reduction in the British uh, influence on, on a Yosco regulatory, uh, regulatory production. And I think the case of ESG might become a new case study on the chapter on um, standards addressed to private uh, uh, to private parties because you know uh, uh, IOSCO uh, has been uh, developing standards direct directed um, uh, to um, rating agencies those for instance you know comparing the different products uh, ESG products and I think in that case uh, we may have if they succeed also in the imp implementation monitoring schemes that, that could be an important uh, uh, case study that would push IOSCO uh, even more forward. Um, 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 that, that's for the ESC, uh, ESG. And for the crypto as asset, I think IOSCO has already produced uh, an important uh, document. That that's the one that connects you know, the digital uh, risks, including crypto assets, especially for you know, volatility and so on for retail investors because it's basically has been, as we have seen um, in the United States, um, uh, you know, uh, basically it's something that, you know, it's so hard to understand the risk that of the, uh, you know, of the uh, protection that we have so far conceived can be, can be, uh, can be easily uh, basically overcome. So um, yes, they have started, you know, producing something, but I think that probably they've been more active on the ESG side. Right, thank you, Antonio. I think I'll probably have to uh, stop you here in terms of your response in order to direct you to uh, a question that uh, one of our uh, um, members of the audience has sent in. Uh, Dr. Eleanor Hickman uh, is uh, at the University of Bristol at the moment, and she's very interested to know uh, how you measured the levels of influence that were exerted in IOSCO. I think it probably relates to why you say that the US influence has been waning and the EU influence has been rising. So how did you measure uh, uh, um, you know, how this influence is exerted? Uh, would you mind elaborating a bit on the yeah. method? Yeah, thank you. It's actually a very interesting question. Um, yeah, uh, that kind of uh, uh, measuring about like the waning and rising uh, of deeper influence is basically based on a lot of reading. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, I um, I went through like legislation at the European level and the American one, and for instance on uh, financial benchmarks on credit rating agencies. Then I read the standards and I ran a comparative analysis of the different standards. So um, if the, uh, you, you, let's take the example of the creating rating agencies. Um, uh, here we see like the first IOSCO code that was very close to a draft 
uh, of just uh, three, four, five years before uh, uh, of the SEC. Um, and at that time, uh, uh, Caesar, uh, the predecessor of ESMA, was just referring to the IOSCO code. So there was an indirect reference of the US approach. But then, um, uh, after the establishment of ESMA, uh, the European Union, for instance, put forward specific uh, requests. Uh, one of those, one of the most important is like uh, colleges of supervisors, which would have put um, uh, US uh, creating rating agencies under uh, a co-supervision of ESMA. And this actually happened. And I'm talking about a change in the IOSCO code of conduct for uh, um, uh, CRA, CRAs, so uh, credit rating agency. So basically it's how a measure is a look at the standards, a look at the domestic legislation, and then how IOSCO standards have changed over the time. Uh, it, it implies, unfortunately, for myself and for my eyes, a lot of rating, of course. Uh, another example could be uh, investor protection. Um, um, here we, we see MIFID, uh, you know, and the MIFID approach influencing a lot IOSCO. Uh, and a strong reaction, specifically when MIFID II was drafted, was being drafted uh, in Brussels, and uh, IOSCO was at the same time issuing a very interesting paper, very interesting uh, set of standards on uh, suitability uh, for hedge funds sold at uh, structured products sold at retail level. And here we see IOSCO taking the MIFID approach on the suitability test. Uh, and the strong reaction of two commissioners from the SEC who publicly you know, issued a statement saying that that set of standard could not apply to the US, to the SEC, uh, because it was basically, uh, um, you know, there was running afoul the traditional uh, uh, approach of uh, uh, the US investor protection uh, uh, framework. So it's, uh, yes, this is, for instance, another uh, very good example of how the EU uh, uh, has been able to influence IOSCO and, uh, and how the US, uh, you know, has been uh, um, uh, reducing its uh, power of influence on IOSCO standards. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio, for highlighting how this um, comparative legal method works. And, and I think, you know, with all of our legal methods, that there is some form of uh, just kind of proxy analysis uh, uh, ra rather than necessarily kind of direct or, or empirical research on, on the sort of influence that has been exercised. But um, this is a very, very fascinating and, and big work. Uh, so thank you very much for bringing this into uh, the community you know, of uh, legal academics, into the community for legal literature. Uh, very, very appreciate uh, this, this, this work that contributes to um, insights, especially in terms of international and transnational securities regulation. I mean, I, I have lots of um, issues and questions I would like to raise myself, but of course we have completely run, run out of time. Um, I'll probably just like to say that, you know, in, in light of uh, what uh, Pierre Henri has mentioned about crypto assets, I think it remains to be seen. You know, what IOSCO does with, uh, with Mika, as well as uh, with the recent um, UK consultation paper on the regulation of crypto assets, which is um, very well thought out, I mean, in, in, in my view. And so um, it probably also plays well for IOSCO to, to adopt a certain high level, but um, rather easily agreed principles where, where, pe where consensus can be easily found. Uh, but IOSCO still exists, I believe, in the shadow of um, regulatory competition. And I think that is still as alive, you know, as ever. Right. Um, on, on that note, uh, we have slightly overrun our webinar, but uh, I thank uh, all our speakers and uh, the members of our audience for staying with us. Uh, once again, thank you, Antonio, for giving us uh, uh, an account of the thank you. in your book. Uh, and thank you, Regis, and thank you, Pei Henri, for your wonderful reflections uh, and for teasing out even more the reasons why we should read this book and interrogate uh, some of its findings. Uh, thank you, members of the audience, for being with us, uh, and uh, apologies for the slight overrunning of the webinar. But I hope that uh, all of us um, will have uh, food to take away with in terms of food for thought. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll all uh, be able to meet in person and catch up over these wonderful topics. So thank you uh, very much again uh, to my panel uh, and to all members of the audience and have a very nice rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye everybody. Thank you.